Well, good morning. It is so great to be here, for our family to be here. And uh, I, I just want to introduce uh, my family before we begin. Uh, so I'm here with my wife, Joanna. Uh, she's at the back. Daughter, Amelia, as well. Um, and uh, we can't tell you uh, how encouraging it is for us to be here to share a little bit about the ministry that uh, God has entrusted to us in the United Arab Emirates. Um, and also really encouraged to know that even after this visit, your church will be praying for the work that God is doing in the UAE. <clears throat> well, let me ask you, have you ever wished that there was no death? That somehow we could go on living forever? You know, most times it feels like our life is hard, that the thought of living forever seems so dreadful. But sometimes if we are honest with ourselves, don't we wish that death didn't exist? You know, when I'm with my daughter, Amelia, I find myself wishing that uh, I could go on living uh, for a long time to see her grow up, uh, to see her have her kids and to see the kids grow up and have their kids, and you get the point. Um, but death seems like an inconvenience that will stop me from being with um, my, my daughter throughout her life. Perhaps you felt that. Perhaps you have felt this most when someone that is close to you was dying. In um, June last year, my father passed away. And before he died, he suffered so much that death seemed like a welcome relief for him. But for those who were very close to him, like my mother and myself, uh, we just hate death. And we wish that we could do something to reverse uh, the whole process and to have him back to go to the way that things were before he died. Life is hard. Death is awful. How are we as Christians to think about the reality of death and the shortness of life? Well, this morning, we are going to turn to Psalm 90. Psalm 90, 90 is a meditation on this very idea, the idea of death, the finiteness of man. So please turn in your Bibles to Psalm chapter 90, and I will read the whole chapter for us. A prayer of Moses, the man of God. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You return man to dust and say, return, O children of man. For a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. You sweep them away as with a flood, they are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed, in the evening it fades and withers. For we are brought to an end by your anger, by your wrath we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days pass away under your wrath, we bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone, and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? So, teach us to number our days, that we may get a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Well, I wonder if you noticed who the author of this psalm is. This psalm is a psalm of Moses, we are told. And so this makes 
it the oldest psalm in the book of Psalms in the Bible. Now, if you notice, um, if you were to flip through the book of Psalms, you will notice that the book of Psalms is divided into parts. And this is section four. This is book four in the book of Psalms. Now, many of the Psalms in this section of the book of Psalms are about God's people being in exile and God taking them back safely home. So it is understandable why it would begin with a psalm or a song of Moses, since Moses was used by God to deliver his people, God's people, from Egypt when they were in slavery. But the truths that we see in the psalm are not just relevant for the people back then, but they are very relevant even for us today. You know, we are, fear, we are surrounded by a fear of death and sickness, especially over the last few years. And people all over the world have had to come to terms with the fact that they may die before they are ready to die. So how should we think? According to this psalm, it is important that we meditate not just on the reality of death, but also on the truth of who God is as he has revealed himself to be in these verses. This is what Moses does in this psalm. As he wants us to understand death and the finiteness of man, he also wants us to see who God is. So if you are taking down notes, these are the three points of the sermon this morning. The three things that we want to see from this psalm are, number one, God's eternality. Number two, God's wrath. And number three, God's steadfast love. God's eternality, God's wrath, and God's steadfast love. Let me ask again, why is it important for us to consider these characteristics of God? D.A. Carson says it this way. He says, one of the major causes of confusion among Christians is that our expectations are false. We do not give the subject of evil and suffering enough thought until we ourselves are confronted with a tragedy. And if our beliefs are out of step with the God who has disclosed himself in the Bible and supremely in Jesus, then the pain from the personal tragedy may be multiplied many times over as we begin to question the very foundations of our faith. So, brothers and sisters, I pray that as we read this psalm, we will think correctly about who God is. Well, the psalmist begins by reminding the people of God that God has been their dwelling place. Look at verse 1. You know, the idea of dwelling place is a significant theme in all of Scripture. So from Genesis to Revelation, the story of the Bible is a story of how God is making a way for him, a holy God, to dwell in the midst of sinful people. And this is a gracious provision that God is making for his people. So in the Old Testament, we see this in the form of the tabernacle and later the temple. Those were all symbols representing God's presence with his people. But they were not the reality. They were merely pointing forward to the future, to what Christ will accomplish when he comes. All of the story of the Bible is moving towards the future, the future that is guaranteed for God's people, when God will dwell with his people forever. And we know this in our own experience, don't we? That God's people are always happy. They are most happy when they find their dwelling with God. This is still true today. But the question is, how do we know that? How do we take confidence in the fact that this is still true today? He explains in verse 2, it is because God is an eternal God. God has always existed, and that means he will always exist. And let's compare ourselves with God. God is not like us. He says in verse 3, we are made from dust, and to dust we shall return. There is appointed a time for each and every one of us when we must die. The concept of time is different, isn't it? For us, compared to God, verse 4, the psalmist says, a thousand years for God is like one day. When it is past, it is like yesterday. Or as he says, it is like a watch in the night, a short four-hour period in the middle of the night. Now, we think that we live a long time in this world. 
We sometimes complain about how long our life is in this world. And that is because our life is the longest experience that we have or we will ever have. Yet, in God's eyes, our entire life is like but a few moments for him. What we are meant to see in this psalm is how big God is compared to us. Wayne Grudem writes that the difference between God's being and ours is more than the difference between the sun and the candle. More than the difference between the ocean and the raindrop. More than the difference between the Arctic ice and a snowflake. More than the difference between the universe and the room we are sitting in. God's being is qualitatively different. No limitation of this creation should be projected to God. He is the creator. All else is creaturely. All else can pass away in an instant. He necessarily exists forever. That is who God is. So friends, how should we respond as we think about God's eternality? How big our God is? Well, it should humble us, shouldn't it? Even the most intelligent person on earth cannot fully comprehend what it means for God to be eternal. Cannot. In comparison to God, what are we? The psalmist continues in verse 5. We are described as a flood, dream, grass that quickly fades and withers. We are all mortal and much more than we like to think of ourselves. And not only that, we don't leave much of a mark behind when we are gone. You see, in our quest to be more than who we really are, all of us want to leave behind a legacy. And that is because secretly we know that once we die, there might be a few people who might miss us or mourn for us. But a couple of hundred years from now, maybe not even that long, most of us will be forgotten, completely forgotten. We truly are like dreams that seem so fresh when we sleep, but vanish when we wake up. I want to pause and ask you, as you listen to this meditation of Moses, are you discouraged? Do you feel like your life and your efforts are futile? You see, God wants us to meditate on this, not to make us feel miserable about ourselves, but so that we may run to him who is bigger and greater than we all are. You see, we are meant to consider not just the fact that we are finite and that our time in this world will come to an end, but we are also meant to ask, why is that the case? Why is it? that we are faced with death that seems so unnatural to us. So let's consider the second point in verses 7 to 11, and that is God's wrath. So, so far, we are told a lot about the mortality of man, but it is only when we get to verse 7 that we are told the reason for why we die. And it's, sim it's simply this. It is because of God's wrath against us. Friends, I hope you know that there is something wrong when we experience death in this life. It can seem normal, but it is not normal. Death is not part of our design. When God created man, he called them very good in Genesis 1.31. But then man fell into sin in Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve, our first parents, did not follow God's will for their lives. They did not trust God. They rebelled against his good plan for them. And their sin, which seems so small sometimes, corrupted the whole human race. The curse of their sin has affected everyone in the world, including every one of us sitting in this room. And Paul explains to us the problem in Romans 5, 12 this way. He says, sin came into the world through one man, and death came to all. Friends, it's not just Adam and Eve who have sinned. We all have sinned. We all deserve death. Death is the sentence by God on us for our guilt of sin against him. And so every time we see death, it should be a reminder to us that we have offended a holy God. And naturally, we deserve his wrath. Every time we see a friend or a family die, every time we see death in the news, we are meant to see 
how serious our sin is, that it is deserving of death, not just bodily death, but spiritual death. You see, the problem with the way the world thinks about sin is not that they deny the existence of sin. Many people in the world will say that they believe that we are rebelling against God. But the problem with the way the world thinks about sin is that they deny the seriousness of sin. Sin is often talked about or seen as just a slip up, a mistake. And many will laugh at the idea that it is deserving of death. But we have to view our sin in light of who it is against, that it is against a holy God. God is holy, and all of our sin are ultimately against him. It offends him. And in verse 8, Moses points out that God sees all of our sins, even our secret sins. There's no such thing as secret sins to God. God looks at our heart. He sees every thought, every evil desire that we, that we have there every word that we meant to say that did not come out of our mouth, God sees all of it. Nothing escapes his gaze. So you know what that means? It means that the thoughts we think or the things that we think we are doing in the privacy of our homes or the privacy of our phones, the things that we think nobody sees, God sees all of it. Imagine if somebody could broadcast even just the thoughts that we had this week onto the screen here in this room. How mortified we would feel or how ashamed that would make us, right? How much more seriously should we take our sin knowing that God sees all of it, even our secret sins? And so in verse 9 and 10, the psalmist says that God's wrath is against us. It is shown not just in the fact that one day we will all die, that we will not continue to live forever. But it is also shown in the fact that all of that life, all of that time we have in this life, are filled with expressions of God's wrath. The 70 or 80 years that we live in this life, it's not just that they are short, but they are full of toil and trouble. They're full of suffering. They're full of tears. And that is also because of God's wrath against us. It is because we live in this fallen world. It is because of the fall that happened in Genesis chapter 3. Even the good days that we experience in this life are good, only relatively speaking. This is how John Calvin puts it about our life. He says, we live a dying, whining, complaining life, and at last a groan is its termination. What an expressive life we live. Yet, who among us can accuse God? Who among us can say that God is too harsh? Don't we all deserve the suffering that comes to us in this life? Friends, we deserve worse than the suffering that we experience in this world. Yet despite all of the inflictions of God's wrath, how many of us can say that we have actually, seriously, properly taken God's wrath into consideration? Or like the psalmist asks in verse 11, who considers the power of your anger, your wrath according to the fear of you? Many people in this world, and to be honest with you, many who also call themselves Christians are rejecting and resisting the inflictions of God's life, God's wrath in their life, and it is because of this that they do not fear God rightly. Well, in light of all that Moses has said, he finally comes to verse 12 to 17 to explain God's steadfast love. And that is the third point that we will consider. In light of the shortness of life, in light of the wrath of God that we experience in this life, what does Moses do? He prays in verse 12 to 17. And the first thing he prays for is, to, is for God to teach us to number our days so that we may get a heart of wisdom. Now, it is important that we pray that God will give us wisdom, right? We want to pray for wisdom. But notice what is wisdom in the psalm. According to Moses, in this psalm, wisdom is to learn to number our days. It is to consider the fact that we are mortals and we are living a short life in this world. And that's very interesting, isn't it? That we need to be taught 
to number our days? You know, a life in this world has only a certain number of days before it expires. None of us really know when that last day is. When we are young, many of us live our lives as if our life will continue forever, as if we will never die. We are slow to learn the important lesson that Moses wants us to learn, that life is a vapor. We are all taught the lesson of seizing the day, focusing on the troubles that this day brings us. But what is the value that we have in learning to number our days? You see, sometimes in our blindness, we forget that we are finite, that we are coming to an end. We can begin to think that we are like God that we are somehow outside time, that we are not bound by time. It's an important lesson. How do we learn it? Do you notice how we learn it in the psalm? He says, he prays. In other words, God has to teach us to do this. So let me encourage you as a church to pray like the psalmist prays in the psalm, that we will have a heart of wisdom. Let me encourage you to reflect on the mortality of man, the shortness of life, there are many psalms that can help us reflect on this truth. Don't reject these reflections. They may make us sad, but they will make our hearts wiser. Now Moses continues in verse 13 by crying out to God, praying, how long? Even when our days are limited and we feel like they are short, yet we can still say, how long, O Lord? And that is because a life that is full of suffering and affliction makes even the short time that we have here on earth feel very, very long. You know, you've heard the saying, I'm sure, time flies when you're having fun. But consider that the opposite is true too, right? One of the things I started doing during the COVID-19 lockdown several years ago was um, I started doing a 30-minute long workout in our house. And uh, if you knew me, you would know that I'm not in the best shape of my life. And usually 30 minutes seem like they fly by very fast. But those 30 minutes, when I was working out, seemed like they were never ending. And for some reason, the last 10 minutes seemed to go on even longer. <laughs> Have you had this experience of feeling like time seems to slow down when something's going wrong in your life? You may be there right now. You may be going through something especially hard right now. And you are crying out like Moses is in this psalm. How long, O Lord? I just want to say, it's not unspiritual to pray this prayer. How long, O Lord? Because it's not unspiritual to feel the pain and afflictions of living in this world. And it is not unspiritual to cry out for deliverance when we are walking in, in pain and suffering. This is a hopeful prayer. It's filled with hope. This prayer, how long, O oh Lord? Do you notice that this prayer is a recognition of the fact that God is sovereign and that he has compassion on his people? And so what that means is that if you are in Christ, whatever you're going through right now is not going to go on forever. It is full, this life is full of pain, it's full of tears. The tears that we shed cannot be measured, but there is an expiry date to all the troubles that we face in this, in this life. And friends, I just want to say this is true only for those who have repented of their sin and put their faith and trust in Jesus. For those who are not in Christ, do you realize that if they don't turn to him while they have time, they cannot pray this prayer, how long, O oh Lord, because as long as this life seems full of affliction and misery and suffering, it's only a preview of what's to come. For those who are not trusting in Christ, this life only leads into unending suffering under the just wrath of God. And in eternity, those who haven't trusted in Christ cannot pray, how long, O Lord? Because there will be no end to the suffering they face under the judgment of God. So friend, I just want to ask you, if you are here and you haven't put your faith in Jesus yet, I want to point out this encouraging fact. Christ has not returned yet. And that means that this is an opportunity for you to repent. 
In 2 Peter 3, verse 9, Peter says, God is not slow to come, but he is exercising patience towards those who have not repented yet. And we also read that the day of the Lord will come like a thief. So if you haven't repented and turned to Christ, do it today. Turn to him. Turn to Christ because he promises to save and because he has shown that he's able to save. And brothers and sisters in Christ, it is not long that we have to endure. Our hardships, all the injustice that we face living in this world is going to end. The pain that our doctors can't seem to end will end. All of the tears that we are shedding right now will be wiped away forever. God's compassion to us is not slow. He says a thousand years is like one day. Moses says in verse 14 and 15, Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make this last for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen evil. For all the days that we have suffered, for all the years that we have suffered, even more, Moses says, we will rejoice. And that is because of God's steadfast love. Friends, for those who are in Christ, you know what is the most comforting truth about God that we can hear? It is God's steadfast love. The greatest expression of God's steadfast love we know is shown in the person and work of Christ. Think of who Christ was, Christ is. Christ was acquainted with grief. He took on human flesh so that he can be a man of sorrow. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. He was smitten by God for us. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. When he died on the cross, he bore the full wrath of God that we deserve for our sins. If we are free, my brothers and sisters, it is because Christ died in our place on the cross. If we have hope of life, we should know it is because the one who did not deserve to die died for us. Brothers and sisters, is there a greater display of God's love for us than what we see on the cross? You want to see God's steadfast love? Look to the cross. And since it is true that Jesus died for us, it is also true that we will rejoice. Our waiting is not pointless. All that God has promised for us, he will fulfill. And that is because he is a faithful God. Moses closes this psalm in verse 16 and 17 by saying, let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us. Establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Outside the Lord, all of our work is in vain. But as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, he says, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. You see, in Christ... God establishes the work of our hands. So yes, our time is short. Our days are numbered. Our existence is fleeting. But Christ is coming, and the work that we do in Christ, he establishes that. So in light of that, numbering our days means that we should think about taking some radical steps as we live the short life in this world. What does that mean for you? to live in light of this. Maybe for some of you, now is the time to start that conversation with your neighbor that you've been waiting for about the gospel of Jesus. For some of you, now is the time to commit to reading the Bible regularly with another person in church so that you can get, help them get to know God better. For some of you, now is the time to start praying that God will use you to take the gospel to those who have little to no access to the gospel in many parts of the world. Friends, life is short and eternity is long for us not to give ourselves to doing something that may feel risky, but has the potential to bring great glory for Jesus. And I want to encourage you that you may not feel like you're doing something big with your life. You may not feel like you're doing something radical, but don't underestimate the ordinary work that you are doing to serve others and to bring glory to God. Our work does not need to be grand or impressive for God to establish it. The smallest act that we do to serve others 
is noticed by God. It may go unnoticed by others, but is used by God. So, whether you're just cooking meals for others, whether you're just praying for others and nobody knows, maybe you're just giving rides so that people can get to church, and maybe nobody sees this, but your ministry is just teaching kids about Christ so that they may come to know him. Maybe you're just showing up early to church so that you may welcome others to church. Whatever it is, the Lord takes all of those small acts done for Christ in Christ and establishes it. You may think that nothing much has happened, but the Lord can use your church to leave an imprint that lasts forever. Hear these words from the great English cricketer C.T. Studd. He says, Only one life, yes, only one, soon with its fleeting hours be done. Then in that day my Lord to meet and stand before his judgment seat. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for the work that you have done in Christ for us. Father, we know, Lord, that even though we think that we are living forever, sometimes we make the mistake of equating ourselves with you. We know that the reality is our life is very short in this this world. But we know, Lord, that our existence is not pointless because in Christ you establish the work of our hands. And Father, we want to pray, Lord, that even as we continue to meditate on what Christ is doing through his church right now in the world, Help us to have great hope for the work that is yet to be done. We pray all this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.